Joe Biden campaigned with putting climate change back at the top of the political agenda in the U.S. And during his first 100 days, he's made a number of, in fact, a stunning number of announcements about various aspects of climate policy. And one of those is he wants the U.S., in his words, to regain the global leadership on climate change. Well, it's fair to say that during the Trump years that Europe was clearly seen as the leader on climate policy. And I'm kind of curious what the Europeans think of Joe Biden. So I'm going to talk to uh, Dr. Akshat Rathi, who is an energy and climate reporter with Bloomberg. So welcome to the interview, Akshat. Hi. So give me your response uh, and maybe the European response to Joe Biden's uh, aspirations. I think what is a climate leader is a good question to ask before we even get to whether the US is a climate leader. Now, from a perspective of just per capita emissions, the US is at 16 tons, which is uh, you know three times, four times the, the global average and eight times what India's per capita emissions are. Um, relative to its peers, which would be European countries largely, uh, it has not cut those emissions any sooner. Uh, you know, the UK is on the verge of eliminating coal from its mix, for example. Um, and that's not the case with the US. Yes, coal has been on, on a decline, but it hasn't gone away. Um, and even within the US, and you know, if you speak to environmental groups, and, and we had uh, in one of our interviews, uh, a scientist from uh, Friends of the Earth, who said, the US is seen as a climate leader domestically, but really internationally, people don't speak about the US as a leader. It's had a deeply divided political uh, uh, gridlock in, uh, in Washington. And uh, because of the gridlock has got nowhere close to the kinds of policies uh, that you would need to be a climate leader. And Europe can, can legitimately claim that, uh, especially uh, over the last 18 months with uh, the laws that it has passed for net zero emissions. These are not just goals, they are legislated and the governments are now mandated to cut those emissions. So there's a lot more teeth to what the what Europe is doing. And all the initiatives that have come from Biden, they are welcome, but they don't quite yet uh, bring the US to the fore as a leader. And I suppose there's the counter argument that what while Biden has proposed various measures, uh, he still has to pay for them. And the Absolutely. spending bills uh, uh, will be opposed by Republicans in both the House and the Senate, and even some of his own Democratic uh, uh, members. So uh, that lends a, a fair amount of uncertainty, uh, even to the things that he is trying to accomplish. Absolutely. And uh, legislation is, again, as we talked, is, is very difficult to get through uh, the U.S. Congress, even though uh, Democrats have a majority in uh, the House and uh, just about a majority in the Senate, because many of the laws require the Senate to have a super majority of 60 votes, which means turning a lot of Republicans on your side. And that's not something Republicans have yet shown any sign of agreeing to. That said, what he has done is certainly remarkable. It is 100% uh, the most uh, climate-friendly agenda that any US president has had historically. And he has stepped up uh, to the challenge. So yes, there are still ways to go in a, even the goal setting for it to claim to be close to what Europe has done, but it is not, uh, it is being taken with the seriousness that uh, climate deserves today. So at least from a um, signaling perspective and thought perspective, both of those uh, are uh, a refreshing change for us to see from here in Europe. Well, here's another perspective on it, and I'll give it uh, the, the Canadian one, which is Canada is also a very high per capita emitter. And, uh, and has done you know, a lot of talking and uh, much less doing. And it seems to me that while Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has been ambitious and put in a, a policy framework and is committing dollars to it, you know, there's still a lot of concern that we, Canada will not get to where it needs to be. But it's also true that you know, Joe Biden is looking at North America. And he's saying, well, here, what about my partners? What about my neighbors in Mexico and Canada? 
And it may be that Joe Biden's uh, higher climate ambitions also has a spillover effect into its neighbors. Certainly, uh, it will have a spillover effect, not just into its neighbors, but globally. Uh, now, you know, America as the bully uh, of global affairs has a certain amount of heft and power, not just to move uh, countries that are already to some extent aligned like Canada, but uh, to even move countries like Australia, which have uh, not been uh, very climate friendly and do not have governments that are climate friendly. Uh, we could see clearly that Scott Morrison, uh, the prime minister in Australia, uh, when he came to the summit, had to try and show that, you know, we do actually take this seriously, just listen to us. But it wasn't enough because uh, the, the uh, Biden administration rebuffed those uh, statements because they were not backed by the seriousness that Australia needs to bring to the table. So we'll see more of that. We'll see that too, uh, happening with Saudi Arabia, with Russia, with Brazil, and that will have an impact. Uh, you know, so it, it is good to have at least the, the largest uh, economy uh, on the table now with climate diplomacy. Well, let's talk about climate and the economy, because I think that one thing that Biden has done uh, that uh, is very positive for the climate is link it to the future uh, uh, economic growth. And he's made it very clear that, that he wants the U.S. to lead in uh, of all of the nations. He wants to lead on clean energy and clean technology. And so now that money's on the table, uh, that seems to be an American strength. As soon as you can make money off something, then they're, they're in and with both feet. And uh, that may be something that sets him apart in terms of achieving success from his successors. It's possible. And especially now that they are seeing uh, other countries go ahead uh, of them in these uh, competitive industries uh, of the 21st century, you know, we've talked about uh, how far ahead China is on essentially all clean energy technology from solar, wind, batteries, electric cars. And that was domestic uh, uh, dominance because China is also a big consumer of these technologies. But now we are seeing uh, China start exporting not just solar panels and wind turbines, but also batteries and even electric cars. We here in Europe uh, have at least three Chinese companies uh, with you know, different rebrands that are competing for uh, selling their electric cars in uh, European markets and finding buyers clearly. So uh, Joe Biden sees that as a challenge. Uh, and you know, if he doesn't step up to it, Europe, uh, the US will fall behind. Um, and we are seeing Europe was also behind in these things and is stepping up. Clearly, electrification of transport is one area where Europe has stepped up a lot with how much it's investing in batteries, how it's bringing along its uh, auto industry like Volkswagen uh, onward uh, to this. And, and so yeah, the U.S. is looking at that and learning from it. One final question, uh, Akshat. Uh, any thoughts on what the Americans are going to bring to the the next IPCC uh, uh, event uh, is conference in, in the fall. So it's unclear whether that will happen. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, vaccinations are going relatively well in, in some countries uh, in the West, but they are not going well anywhere else. And uh, there is clearly demand from the environmental groups that there be equity uh, in place when these meetings happen, that you don't end up with the Americans and the, and the Brits being in Glasgow and everybody else joining virtually because that would be unfair. So we don't know uh, whether that'll go ahead this year, but if it does, I think the thing that uh, America can do the most on is climate finance. So one of the things that needs to be uh, agreed upon in this uh, meeting uh, in Glasgow is the rules on which uh, climate finance will operate across the globe uh, of how money will have to go from rich countries to developing countries toward technology development and adaptation to climate change. Um, and those rules are up in the air and it, it, it's you know late, we are late on those. They should have been agreed in 2020 they, they need to be agreed in 2021, and hopefully they would be. Uh, just on a, a, an observation on that, I interviewed Dr. Uh, Johan uh, Erpelainen from Johns Hopkins about that issue. And he pointed out that uh, China is actually well ahead of the United States in terms of providing green finance 
both within its own borders and with part as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And this was an area where Biden was and the, you know, the uh, investor community in the United States was really going to have to step up if, if it wanted to be influential in global markets. That's true. I mean, we should also recognize that China is also ahead in quote unquote brown financing or fossil fuel financing uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative. So China has this sort of almost um, uh, contradictory role in uh, in being both a technology leader in green technologies and yet being a huge, huge supporter and consumer of fossil fuels. So um, whereas in the US at least, both financing are low. So they're not really financing green stuff, but they're also not financing as much fossil fuels abroad. Uh, but certainly, you know, in that sense, if European countries and, and America uh, steps up to, to do more green financing, they can certainly go ahead of what China is doing. Akshat, thank you. Always appreciate your insights. Great to be here. Thanks.